it's really important to establish the overall structure of the entire soundtrack as much as you possibly can in a game because things change all the time in in game development um, but you've got to kind of know where the key pillars are and then you you build around those um, so for example there are, there are probably three key sequences that kind of the soundtrack was born from um, and I believe in every other interview I've never actually mentioned this <laughs> Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to the Sound Iron Podcast. I am your host, Craig Peters. And today on the podcast, we're going to be talking with composer Gareth Coker, who is an award-winning British composer for film, games, and commercials. He's composed the music for games like Ori and the Blind Forest, which was reviewed as one of the highest-rated games on Xbox One and has won a ton of awards. And we're also going to be talking about his involvement with the game Ark Survival Evolved, The Unspoken, and a bunch more. So stick around. Well, first off, Gareth, I want to thank you for taking the time to sit down and talk with me. So how have you been? Doing pretty good. Uh, just uh, like you, struggling with this California heat. I'm British, so I'm not really... Even though I've been here for nine years, I still am not used to how hot it gets uh, out here, especially during August and September when it regularly reaches like over 110 degrees, and it usually feels 10 degrees hotter than that. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I'm still struggling with that. But other than that, things are good. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it's been... Uh... It's been burning out here. Some days, some days are hotter than others. Like sometimes I go outside and it's not too bad, and then sometimes I do and I just run back in because I feel like my face is gonna melt. Right. Off. <laughs> well, um, for anyone who's not too familiar with you and uh, in your work, um, what I'd like to talk to a little bit about is uh, kind of how you got into music and what are some of your earlier influences that kind of brought you to the you know to where you are now as far as being a you know composer for games and film oh uh let's see so i think i think when my first my first awareness of music and film um was after seeing forrest gump um at the age of at the age of i would have been nine at the time um I was probably too young to get all of the themes that the film was trying to convey, but uh, the like the story themes. Uh, but you know, even as a kid, there's a lot to enjoy in Forrest Gump. Um, but one thing that did stick with me, and I just started learning the piano at the time, um, was Forrest Gump's main theme, which plays over mm-hmm. the opening titles. It's about three minutes long, um, yeah. and it's this solo, wistful solo piano thing that Alan Silvestri does, and that was the first piece of sheet music that I ever bought. Um, well, I guess my parents bought it because I didn't have any money when I was nine. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was probably the first time I was aware of it. Um, but I didn't really start composing music until I was 16. And even then, it was kind of uh, something I just did. I wasn't really like, I'm going to be a composer. Um, mm-hmm. I was in high school jazz band, which I think is where I realized I could create on the fly. Um, so my improvisation skills gradually bled over into creating original works for piano. Um, And then my music teacher at high school was like, you should apply to go to music school. And I was like, (laughs) okay. Um, And I went in with an attitude of I have nothing to lose. So, um, but I I didn't have any clue how to write for the orchestra. Um, And I, I didn't, I'd never really written for anything other than piano. So, um, really, they got a portfolio of work that was just a bunch of piano tracks and this one thing for string quartet and then some synth stuff. Um, They said the reason that they accepted me was because I could write a tune, um, which I regard as, like, one of the key things anyway for for, for our job. Um, mm-hmm. but like, that was the reason I got accepted. And from then on, I was like, okay, well, I guess maybe I need to invest time into being a composer now. Um, cause I'm at school <laughs> doing it. Um, yeah. and then after that, um, I, well, I graduated from music school. I spent three years in Japan teaching English, which had nothing to do with my music career. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, needed to, needed to earn some money and also experience real life. Um, mm-hmm. But also um, that that preparation for real life helped me prepare for everything that Los Angeles and Hollywood is. 
Um, yeah. Then I came here and studied at the University of Southern California. Um, they have a great one-year program. Um, and, uh, yeah, did that course. And then just have gradually worked my way through the, the trenches of the industry to, to get to where I am today. As for as for early influences, I mean, obviously, Alan Silvestri is it will be, you know, will always be the first one because um, because of that tune that he wrote. Yeah, but kind again, jump started all of it. I, 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 I just don't remember listening to that many film scores when I was when I was young. Um, I was just still listening to, you know, pop stuff. I listened to a lot of U2. I listened to Radiohead. I listened to Muse. Mm -hmm. Um, I listened to a lot of electronic music when I was younger. I don't really remember actively going out and buying soundtracks until I'd started university. And even then, it was only in my second and third year. Um, I've always sought to find inspiration from stuff that isn't soundtracks. Um, because mm -hmm. And it's, that, that advice especially holds true now because you know almost all soundtracks are influenced from something else. So why not go, yeah. to, why not go to the source rather than... Um, rather than an actual soundtrack, why not go to the thing that that soundtrack was inspired by? Um, so, yeah, I mean, other than that, the inf the, the influences on me um, musically, because I know people are going to want names. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, I mean, probably two of the biggest ones are uh, Thomas Newman, James Newton Howard, and Michael, um, Michael Danner. Mm -hmm. Um those three, they don't have a similar sound, but they have a similar vibe in all their film schools. And I feel like the, um, oh, and sorry, and James Horner, of course. Um, <laughs> I feel like those four, um, they really do an amazing job capturing the spirit of the films that they write for. It's not just about matching the the mood um, on on screen. It's not just ma about matching the story and um, providing the right emotional moments for the story they they really they you, you hear one piece of music from one of their scores and so often you can identify the film that it's from they, they were able to not only score the film but also brand the film um and kind of make it their own um it's mm -hmm. it's like they created a, their own world they, you're, you're able to be taken to a different place whenever you listen to one of their scores because even though they do feature the orchestra it's never really just the orchestra or the orchestra has been written in such a unique way that um, it's not what everyone else is doing um, or they've written an amazing melody and thus it stands on its own and, and, and can't ever be replicated by anything else. Yeah, that's funny you say that because I, well, I was listening to the music for Ori and the Blind Forest and the first thing that it made me think of was like I just felt like I was like sort of enveloped in this world it's very, uh, you know, very musical. Has you know this very like uh, fantasy kind of feel, and it was just like that's the like the perfect way to put it. It was just like this very like uh, I don't know, sonic and musical world is really cool. And uh, um, when it came to that score, uh, how did you go about crafting the sound for that game? Like, was that something that you really worked with with the with the creators of the game, or like how did how did you sort of come up with the the overall sound or tone? I mean, I kind of had uh, completely free reign for that project, which is unusual given that I had barely any experience. Um, they they were, ju they were just of the opinion that, you know, put stuff in the game, see if it works, and then if you think it works, you can present it to us. Um, so, so the thing that helped me the most is that I had um, great access to the game for the entire period of development and I was on the pro oh, yeah. I was on the project for like three to four years now it doesn't mean I was working full-time on the project for three to four years um, but I was around it um, and thus I knew I knew every detail about the game before I actually got into crunch time for writing music um, you know, I knew all the levels, I knew how Ori moved, I knew all of the attacks, I knew all of the key cutscenes in the game, where they occurred, when they occurred, what emotion the player is supposed to be experiencing at any given time. Um, so I was kind of able to figure out the flow of the game. And for, for me, like, the flow informs everything else, like how you how you orchestrate, how you, um, how you wh where you put the melody, where you don't put the melody, etc., etc. Um, mm -hmm. It's really important to establish the overall structure of the entire soundtrack 
as much as you possibly can in a game because things change all the time in in game development yeah. um, but you've got to kind of know where the key pillars are and then you you build around those um, so for example there are, there are probably three key sequences that kind of the soundtrack was born from um, and I believe in every other interview I've never actually mentioned this um, so oh, nice. <laughs> um, so the first is obviously it's the opening the opening like nine to ten minutes of the game the prologue um, we do a lot of scene setting there um, and a lot of storytelling to like get the player prepared for what is to come mm-hmm. um, then there's a cutscene about 20 25 minutes depending on your ability into the game um ori arrives at the spirit tree and that's really like the first presentation of ori's theme in full it's very ethereal it's it's called the spirit tree on soundtracks so it's pretty easy to find oh, okay um you hear it obviously in the you hear the main theme in the main menu of course but this is like a slightly more grandiose presentation of it nice. um and then like the key sequence and this was one of the first sequences that we finished in the game um i remember because we, like, we were really sweating it out before gamescom gamescom 2014 was when we were when we were doing this um it was the ginzo tree and the water escape sequence which which everyone knows um anyone mm-hmm. who's played the game everyone knows the sequence um and it's not just the what we call the boss fight at the end it's not a boss fight you're basically just trying to escape rushing water but it's mm-hmm. everything <clears throat> it's everything that leads up to that point then the chase sequence itself then the cutscene after that and then the next sequence of gameplay after that it's how all of those elements flow into one one another and feel like a cohesive piece of music even though it's technically speaking i mean for any person who's played the game it could take you if you're good, it could take you as little as ten minutes, and if you're, you know, if you're not so good, it can take you up to an hour. But it should always feel continuous um, as you're climbing the Ginzo tree and then escaping it, and then having the cutscene at the end. That sequence and the other two, um, we got those finished, and then I was like, okay, I know how to do the rest of this game um, <laughs> because the approach that worked for one area I ended up using for other areas and it just seemed to work. Um, the, the One of the great things about the design of Ori is that the, the, the areas of the game, we've got lots of different environmental areas. So there's the Ginzo tree, the Forlorn Ruins, which is a more icy and frozen area, the Misty Woods, which is this crazy place which has no map and you're supposed to feel disoriented. Um, we've got tons of these areas which they are quite big, but they're also not too big, so you don't um, you don't end up getting stuck there for too long unless un- unless like you're dying a lot, um, and that <laughs> that means that means you're not having to you're not having to write huge amounts of music. You're having to write just enough to keep the player engaged, because um, I think I think there's a limit to like how much music you know you can put. You can put in it. You can put in a game before it starts to become redundant. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's you. You want to find a balance between quality and quantity. And the, and the nice thing about Ori's areas, um, where I I'd never felt bogged down in one area for too long. It's like not like oh no, I have to write another four minute queue for mm-hmm. the the th- the area that I've already written three four minute queues for. Um, I think no area has more than eight minutes, maybe ten, apart from the Ginzo tree, actually. I think no more area has more than, like, eight to ten minutes of music written for it. Um, uh, so, oh, and, and the final area. Uh, but, like, overall, it's fairly self-contained. Um, so, yeah, once I've decided those initial... Uh, once sorry, Not decided. Once those first areas were written, it made it very much more straightforward i mean not completely straightforward obviously to handle all the other areas of the game um and then it was really just an exercise in instrumentation and orchestration um just making the areas feel and sound different to another but also Mm -hmm. keeping the consistent overall aesthetic that we've established with those three other areas nice have you ever had a situation where you came up with the main theme more like during the middle of the process and then sort of reworked the music around that. Yeah, I mean the main theme, like it was not the, the the actual first real sign of a theme that we had for the game is actually the 
the piece that plays at the very beginning of the prologue, which a lot of people think is the main theme, but it's it's really not. Um, the main theme is what you hear in the main menu. Um, but I would say the first thematic idea was was that piece when the leaf falls off the tree. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think it's one of those things. If you come up, great melodies don't grow on trees. If they did, uh, life would be a lot easier. <laughs> life would be a lot easier. Um, yeah. And you know, if you do stumble upon something that works even better, yeah, it's going to be more work, but you have to go back and rework it in because you 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 might just stumble across it um, later on, and especially when you're working on a game for as you know for as long as most composers work on games. Mm-hmm. You're not if you're working on a game for twelve months. The chances are you're not going to have an amazing idea every day for twelve months. Uh, yeah, that's just not how it works. Even John Williams does probably doesn't have an amazing idea every. Um, yeah, he didn't write the Star Wars theme every day of his life. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, these things take time. I think, I do think though that the, as it's p- kind of part of the fermentation process of finding the sound for a score. Um, mm-hmm. I think, generally speaking, if you've not found the theme after you've written like a quarter or a third of the music, you've you've probably got problems. But even then, you might have something in that first quarter or third of a material that you can develop and work on. Um, I think five or six years ago when I was a less experienced composer, instead of like trying to work with existing material that I had, I'd probably just be like, oh, I'll just start again from scratch and write Mm -hmm. another piece and write another piece and write another piece. Um, I think one of the things that's hard for composers who are starting out to do is to develop initial ideas rather than like oh I'll do, it, i think it's it's actually not too hard to come up with a, a decent initial idea um but it's figuring out whether to commit to it and develop it some more and come up instead of a two to three bar motif okay now develop that into that into a true like eight bar or 16 bar melody that takes a little mm-hmm. bit more effort and discipline um and it's not as fun as just <laughs> putting together a couple of cool new sounds and yeah. whacking you know two to three measures of something great together um but i think if you can do that you'll get something that's a lot more lasting because you don't have to use all 16 measures of the melody every single time you can just use fragments of it and then you can play it in reverse or uh yeah. you know elongate it or shorten it or there's so many things you can do if you have one amazing theme and then if you have two or three well then you're really in business um mm-hmm. so um with with ori we we kind of use the one theme a lot because it is, you know, it is the title of the game, uh, and there's only you only play as one character, and the the peripheral characters are not, you know, you don't spend much time with them. Um, but to move on, well, not move on, but like to to move to the future, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Anyone who's seen the the two trailers, it's pretty obvious mm-hmm. that we have a fairly you know important second character because we've you know we've we've shown that second character in the trailer quite heavily. So yeah, um, so that's an opportunity to to write a second theme. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, it, it'll be nice to have um, something to play off the Ori theme. Um, mm-hmm. wh- whereas for the first game, I didn't do much of that. Yeah, I was watching that trailer the other day, and it's just as top notch, I think, as you know, or in the blind forest. And uh, there was this one part; I think it was like a, a minute, like around a minute and a half, where it just like peaks and gets super epic. And I thought it was really cool. And um, so, doing the uh, the first one, do you feel like, of course, that just makes doing this game that much easier, or do you feel it's a little bit harder because you have that challenge of not wanting to repeat yourself? Or yeah, I mean, you you kind of want to do something new but it's also got to feel familiar because people are there there is a dna that we created with the first game and it's not just it's not just the um you know it's not just the music it's the art as well it's the gameplay the gameplay's got to feel the same um but it's got to feel the same and we've got to do new stuff and so at this year's e3 we're like okay well here's here's the new gameplay and we've really overhauled combat because we're now giving you a sword a bow a spear um and all of this other stuff that was not in the first game and mm-hmm. well you guys are going to tell us if it still feels like ori and fortunately it does um awesome the, the art is way way more layered than it was before in in the original game like there's there's a lot of depth now um 
and that's that's kind of a fundamental change. It's 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 not a 3D game, but it looks more 3D if that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. And then the music too. It's like you know, if if people fire up the game and they don't hear the main theme, they're gonna be like, what's going on? Uh, yeah, what game is this? <laughs> right. Um, so you know, but but you know, we'll do a new recording and we'll do a new arrangement of the main theme so people can hear something new on the main menu. Um, and um, as for the music. I think because of like the you know there's there's going to be so many new environments which again we've hinted at in the trailer that already gives me a kind of a new canvas to work on and again as we showed in the trailer I mean we've not just got one additional new character it's pretty obvious that you're going to see a lot more creatures in this uh mm-hmm. in this game like in the first trailer we showed the giant toad um and the spider um, we did we did the same and we did the same in uh, this one as well so like that's probably going to be an opportunity to do something new and interesting for, for those guys too um, so I think I have enough new material to work with because the game that we're doing so much new cut and cool stuff in the game that always informs the music and so I have a lot of new material to work with yeah. um, this is not going to be Ori 1.5, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it definitely it definitely does feel like feel like we're making a true sequel and we're really just trying to outdo ourselves uh, as best as we can on, on every aspect of the game. Um, so so there's no there's no let up for any department. <laughs> that's great. Uh, when it comes to melody, and I think that's one of the things that I've really noticed about your style is your your melodies and the way you sort of put it all together is really, really cool. And um, when it comes to, I guess, you know, creating the harmonic structure of something, are you more of like a chords first, melody second guy? Or do you, does it depend like on the situation or just how you're feeling? Or are you always kind of like melody first and then kind of base everything else around it i think harmony informs everything but um usually what happens is i'll write the melody and the harmony at the same time and then what always happens is i I catch myself falling into the same harmonic traps i'm like i've used that chord sequence before i've used that chord sequence before so i'll generally try and get something that's you know four to eight measures long that's workable and then Mm -hmm. and then after that i'll look at the harmonic structure and think okay what can i change um so like arc the arc survival evolved melody the mm-hmm. the harmony for the opening is chord 1 and chord 5 repeated twice and i was like okay well i can't really stay on chord 1 and 5 and do do the melody over over the whole the whole thing but what makes the mel- the, the, the key of the melody is in b flat b flat minor um mm-hmm. But what makes it more interesting is moving to B major on the fifth chord, um, and then moving back to like a back to something that feels like a, a B. It's it's actually an E flat major chord, but it's on B flat on the bass. Uh, okay. Just just moving to somewhere different, even just for a little bit, gives you so much more flexibility. Um, rather than you know staying, on, there's nothing wrong with chords one, four, and five, and you know the minor sixth chord um which a lot of people (laughs) use especially in film um but like uh it it doesn't take much to go somewhere else um i think because most of us when we're most most composers when they're sitting at the keyboard thrashing things out they're playing chords with the left hand and they're playing melody with the right hand that is probably how most composers are writing um and when you're doing that almost every time you're probably writing root position chords with the left hand and root position is like it's great because it's it's a fundamental part of film music but where things get really interesting is like just stop yourself for for one second and instead of playing a root position chord just move like literally one finger of your hand usually the bottom one and move it just anywhere else and see what happens um Mm -hmm. because some really interesting things start to happen once you move away from root position and just change the bass notes of the chord but because of the way because of the way sequences are sequences are and the, the way music software is we always end up just right i think we always end up the starting point is writing stuff in root position mm-hmm. and that that can end up being limiting and forcing you down the same paths that you've been through before um you know if you look at trailer music like literally everything is in root position but the really good trailer music has like that one chord that makes it interesting 
Uh, yeah. Like, oh, they finally did something different with the bass. And once you've done that once, you have like a million more options of a new chord for where to move to. Um, so if you've got any, if we've got any uh, people who are starting up listening, or even you know even established composers, but, but they probably know this. But like move move away from that root position stuff. Just be more experimental with the the left hand because it it can get you out of it. It gets me out of writer's block almost every single time because that's what, awesome. Because once you're finishing, once you're once you're moving in a new harmonic direction, the ideas come thick and fast. I think the main the main way people get stuck is because they not really think spending enough time on the harmony. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really cool tip. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the Ark Survival game because uh, that score is just com- it's funny. It's like a total <laughs> yes. total flip from you yep. know because you know Ori. I mean it. You know it has like some little like action cues and stuff too. But that that game is just it's intense. Like the yes. music for that and uh, uh, it's funny. I was, I was watching the interview that you were talking about where you had to do a cue that was like formed the uh, the track the Overseer. Yes, right. Yeah, where you're like it's you know 200 BPM and it's four minutes long, and I was just like I, I was like because I was already listening to the score, but I was like I want to I'm gonna listen to that again like specifically, and I was just like whoa, he wasn't kidding. This this is a uh, pretty intense. It's like the whole way through, it's just driving, and there's even some parts where it sounds kind of shreddy, like some of the violins yep. are just you know playing these like really quick like 30 second notes, and I was just like wow. Like this, like I could only imagine being there and seeing the players probably just like sweating all crazy and. Well, you want to know? You want to know something funny about that? We so, yeah. so, so so that cue, uh, so most film scores these days are recorded. You know, we you record the section separately and then you put it all together in the mix. Um, we could have done that for this, but that cue is actually everyone in the room at the same time. And here's the best part: it's take two. Oh wow. And I, I remember at the recording, we were at Abbey Road with the Philharmonia Orchestra, which is like one of the highlights of my life so far. Oh, yeah. uh, we had 93 players, um, which is just insanity. Um, yeah. And I remember like at the end of take two, I, I looked around to, to Zach, who he's my guy. He, he just comes with me on everything. He's a second, second pair of ears for me. And mm-hmm. I looked at Simon Rhodes, the engineer. Simon Rhodes engineered for James Horner, so he kind of knows what he's doing. Oh, yeah. And we just... <laughs> And then Alex, my conductor, was out in the room, and we basically all just looked at each other, and we were like, "Yeah, yeah, I guess that's done." Um, so, um, <laughs> but it was one of those things. I told the players just before we started the queue, I was like, "I think this is going to be the most challenging queue," and I think when the players hear that, they're like, "Ooh, that's exciting! Let's, uh, all right, let's, uh, let's, sh- let's show him what we're made of," kind of thing. That's um, awesome. And I, they, you know, it, it's it's quite a fun piece to play. There's something for everyone to do. Um, mm. Like the basses get the melody. You know, er- everyone gets the melody at some point or like some kind of motif. They're not just chugging away the whole time. Yeah. Um, it is, it is a more musical action piece than some. Uh, so um, there's a, there's there's a lot going. It does sound like there's a lot going on, but actually. Um, it's it's quite a well structured piece. I I spent quite a oh, lo- yeah, totally. lo- long time on that. So so like I think everyone knows exactly what they're like. Once they played through take one, everyone kind of knew already what they were doing. One of the things about recording with an orchestra is like you don't usually get it on take two because take one they're learning the piece. Take two they're figuring out what everyone is doing, and then take three is when the magic usually starts to happen. Yeah. Um, but I think because this, even though it sounds crazy and frantic, what was in front of the players made sense and wasn't complicated so it's more about like the individual elements locking together um and yeah when we when we recorded it i was like you know take one was excellent and then take two it was just like well i i i don't know what to say and probably the morale is really (laughs) high right now because they know they nailed it um and and it sounded really good coming through the speakers so it's just like well let's move on um and then you guys didn't listen to it again or like i wanted to move on to keep them in the zone uh i i tend to listen to things during break um so okay because you know you can always go back uh yeah so uh yeah i just wanted to be like okay well let's keep we've got something special going on right now a, a lot of recording i think you're dealing with chemistry um mm-hmm. and getting a good recording is you know it's obviously dependent on the music it's then dependent on the players it's dependent on the room that you're in but but really there is a special chemistry that happens especially between the conductor the composer and the players um mm-hmm. and 
uh, every recording I've done, there is always an hour or two where the players are just playing at a slightly higher level. And it's not, it's, you know, you want them to reach that level for the whole thing, but, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just, you know, sometimes the cues don't allow you to do that because sometimes you're just writing something that's supposed to be played in the background. Mm-hmm. Um, but if there is one of those magical hours, then I generally change the running order and I just move a bunch of, you know, difficult cues closer together or important cues because I'm like, the players are really feeling it right now. Um, because, you know, they can play the simple stuff really well as well. Uh, but mm-hmm. if there's if there's something that, you know, is, is a bit heftier, um, then, I, then I move things around because I'm like, the players are definitely feeling it right now um so it's like you know working with a singer is the same thing you know if you book a singer for three hours it's highly unlikely you're going to get the singer on best form for the three hours you know it takes them 30 minutes to get warmed up sorry singers. yeah um, but, um, but once they are warmed up then things start to happen and then they really understand the track and then magic often happens yeah um so it's one of those things you, you kind of want to look out for it. and i think anyone who's done a recording kind of knows it when they when they hear it um obviously with amazing players it's always going to be excellent but then there's mm-hmm. just like that little x factor um where it just happens every so often and you want to you want to you want to embrace that as much as you can because it does like and, and stay on that way for as long as you can it happened on ori as well um, oh awesome and uh we recorded i think five minutes of uh, sorry five pieces of music in one hour um which is unheard of really it's it's it was, <laughs> i think we got through like 12 minutes of music in an hour which is a ridiculous pace um wow. and, and one of the pieces was the uh the escape sequence from the the ginzo tree so um yeah the players were just in a zone um and it was funny because the previous hour we'd struggled um like the pace was a little bit slow and then uh alex my conductor was like yeah i know that was slow we're gonna really whip them into shape for the second hour <laughs> and that i don't know what it was i think i think maybe just everyone had talked during break like that they, 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 they kind of knew that they were struggling a little bit and then everyone came back and played with a vengeance there's there's so much that goes on i mean when you've got even 30 people but when you've got 50 or 60 or as many as we did for arc 90 um there is so much going on you're dealing with humans who have known each other for a very long time and they kind of get what makes each other tick um yeah so um there is i think i it, I've, I've blabbered on about chemistry for way t- way too long but like i think it's a really really important thing for recordings and if you are annoyed during a recording that transmits to the players in like sec in seconds and if you're ha- uh-huh. and if you're happy it transmits in seconds as well and um so it's it's when when you're a composer and you're leading a recording session with your conductor um it is really important that your communication is absolutely top notch because you say one wrong word and it can it can rub someone the wrong way and then you've got something like bristling through the orchestra and that's not good uh. um so um yeah it's uh, it's one of those things that like i i i'm i'm very I, I choose my words carefully like when i'm when i'm at the recording sessions because i i want to make sure um that the vibe for the recording is as good as possible yeah yeah, that's always important. How was it uh, for you orchestrating, you know, a full piece for such a big, um, you know, group of players? Because uh, I always, I always wonder. I'm sure a lot of people, you know, maybe listening to who are just getting into orchestration and you know approaching a project like that with you know so many players. Uh, how, like, do you have any tips as far as like how you go about sort of structuring? all the different parts for the orchestra or is that just kind of something that you just play around with or well i mean the thing is when when it comes to orchestration i mean i i kind of knew my lineup so i knew we were going to have a full orchestra for, for arc at some point i knew we were going to have an orchestra for recording not a huge one um but so for ori which well, I'll, I'll start there and move up so for ori i i knew i had a chamber group um i because we didn't have we didn't have the budget to record full orchestra for um, you know for, for, for two days uh, mm-hmm. and frankly we didn't need full orchestra for two days um, what would the, what would the brass do for like two days on Ori like it's not a brassy game so mm-hmm. um, but for for the whole of the first day we just had a chamber group of twenty two strings it's very easy to orchestrate for twenty two strings so you're really only writing five lines uh, maybe yeah. t- maybe ten if you're dividing 
Um, then the second day on Ori is when we use the bigger orchestra for the bigger for the bigger cues. Um, but even then, like you know, there were no trumpets in in Ori, um, and the brass section was just four horns and three trombones, not even a tuba, um, which was actually a mistake in hindsight. I would have loved to have had tuba, but uh-uh. it's fine. Um, it still <laughs> it still works okay. Um, yeah. And then we just had single woodwind and a bigger string section. Um, so I think it helps going in if you know what your lineup is. Now on a game mm-hmm. like Ark, where it's <laughs> ninety three players, yeah. You're still, it's still fundamentally sections though. You, strings, woodwind, and brass. And I think you have to treat each section similarly. You know, I, I generally do, I generally start with the strings um, because that informs a lot of what I'm going to be doing in the winds and the brass. Um, and it basically depends on which section of instruments I think is going to be doing more work. If I think if woodwinds are going to be doing more work, then I'll do the woodwinds next. If I think brass is going to be doing more work, then I'll do the brass next. For arc, it was mostly brass um, because mm-hmm. it's a very heavy score, um, and we had a massive brass section, so there was awesome. just more lines to deal with. Um, but I think when you've got that many players, it's not to, it, you don't have to be intimidated by the number. You've just got to boil it down to what is the role I want this instrument to play. And you know, if you need more bass, then great. You've got basses to do that. You've potentially got cellos to do that. You've got tubers that can do that. You've got trombones, and you've got bassoons and contrabassoons. And mm-hmm. already that's taken care of, like you know, uh, like a tenth of your players. Um, so mm-hmm. you've just got to find you know roles for for each instrument to do. And you don't have to have every instrument playing all the time. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's a romanticized thing uh, that is that is passed now because film scoring is, is different um, than, mm-hmm. than it used to be. It's okay to have blocks of silence for the players, um, especially when you're using brass because they just can't play the whole time. Uh, wind yeah. instruments in general, they, they need a break. Um, and with a score like Arc, that's a tiring score to play. So it's mm-hmm. like if I have, you know, Overseer, I'm still amazed that they did that in one take because there's a lot of blowing in, <laughs> in Overseer. Yeah. Um, but there are segments where, you know, the instruments are not doing anything like the strings are chugging away and there's stuff in the pre-records that are happening and then oh the brass are back um so that's the other thing is to spread things around as well Mm -hmm. um because that also makes it interesting for the players because they're um they're they're they're, they're hearing and having fun with new textures um but yeah it's don't get intimidated by the number just try and break it down into the role you want the instrument to play um and as for learning about orchestration you can you there's a million courses online and there's a million books that you can read about it but all of those are secondary to being in a room with a player and i'm not talking about being in a room with an orchestra you can go to any music school and i guarantee you if that place has a practice room which you know practice room area which they almost all do you can probably knock on the door and talk to any player and say hey i've got this thing for, uh, for this piece of music I've written for violin or flute or contrabassoon or whatever, you can knock on their door and they'll probably give you 20 minutes of their time. If they don't want to, then like offer to buy them a drink or something. Um, <laughs> because that's how I learned. I and and that's how I learned the basics. Like the study of orchestration is a lifetime study, but yeah. you need real players to tell you what you can and can't do. Mm-hmm. Um, because most of us are writing with sample libraries nowadays. And sample libraries allow you to do things that you can't really do in real life, which is cool. Um, that's that's nice to have. It's nice to have a French horn line that can play for 32 measures without breathing. Um, but it's that's also not particularly musical. Now, if you if you know your stuff isn't going to get played uh, played live, then great, write that 32 measure French horn line. But if you do mm-hmm. know that it's going to get played live, uh, then perhaps you should consider uh, writing it slightly differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but the best, the, the absolute best way to learn, if you if you have any inkling of uncertainty on how to write for a, an instrument, all you have to do is find a player, and they will be happy to tell you, um, because you know then they've made a connection with a composer who might hire them. So um, it's uh, I think that's really important because play, players will tell you will know more about their instrument than you ever will. Um, yeah. So because they're playing it every day. And exactly. we're, we're not. We're just dabbling with our sample libraries and doing cool, cool stuff with them. So yeah, they're um, like, it's a little bit different. Yeah, they're like, can you please program a break in there so I can breathe? Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, what was your first experience working with real players as far as a project goes? 
Um, well, I was lucky. I went to music school technically twice. So my my undergrad, uh, we had four sessions a year. This was at the Royal Academy of Music. So I had some basic experiences there when I still you know, had not a clue how to write for the orchestra. But it was kind of good because I found out very quickly what didn't work. Um, then at the University of Southern California, we also had the same thing. We had, I think, like 10, 10 or 11 sessions throughout throughout the year um, with uh, Los Angeles players, who are obviously mm -hmm. really good. Um, and uh, yeah, it started out small with a string quartet, then we do a wind section, and then we do a small orchestra. Um, but then And then things gradually progressed to like a big 65-piece orchestra right at the end. Um, and that was again was a good experience for for trying things out and figuring out what works. As far as a project goes, um, I did a couple of student films where I had uh, a small budget to get like a small chamber group. Um, here's a neat trick: if you are if you are recording a if you have a budget for a small group, um, instead of and and you need strings instead of like loading up on the violins you'll actually get more mileage if you have more violas and cellos and basses because that will thicken up your sound um, mm -hmm. rather than like having too many violins which if it's a small group it'll just sound thin um, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah if you have a small group that's uh, that's something I learned um, on the job um, but yeah those two short films I got to record at East West Studios here and then after that there was nothing until until Ori so Ori was my first major project recording Oh, awesome. How did, how did that come about? How did you end up getting contacted for that project? Uh, so this is a now almost legendary story because I have told this one a few times, but like it's uh, I was on a website called moddb.com, which is a place where uh, game developers make mods, which are add-ons for, for PC games in their spare time. Oh, okay. And I was quite active on that website and I contributed to a few mods, just pieces of music here and there. And I had my reel up on that website and then the director of Ori found me. He just randomly found me and sent me an email saying, I've got a prototype for a game that we're working on. Um, you know, would you take a look at it? Would you be interested in, in uh, and if you like it, would you be interested in doing the music for the prototype? If you do, if, the pro if we pitch the prototype and it gets picked up, you can do the music for the game. Um, oh, wow. And I was like, I took one look at the game. It looked nothing like what Ori does looks like now, but... Mm -hmm the gameplay felt right. I'm, I'm a gamer. Like I know a good game when I feel one, like when I can tell within 10 minutes of starting game, if I'm going to enjoy a game or not, because the controls, oh, yeah. the controls are so important. If the yeah. controls feel polished, that's going to get me through at least two to three hours. Um, mm -hmm. before I start looking for more mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, that's the thing. The controls felt amazing. And I was like, okay, this guy is onto something. And it also, it looked, it looked fabulous, but it looked different to how it does now. It was more abstract back in the day. Uh, okay. But, uh, I mean, that's partly for budget reasons, I think. I think they were trying yeah. to, you know, they didn't want to invest a huge amount on the, the look of the game so early on. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the pitch was successful, and then that that was it. I scored the game. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was uh, all because I had a profile on a fairly niche website. But you just never know where, where gigs are going to come from. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Um, now I, I want to get a little geeky. I want to go for it. I'm always I'm always curious as far as composer setups, kind of what they use. I know there's sort of like a general kind of everyone there's certain things. Of course, you know you need to don a computer. We know yep. that. But I want to know like uh, I want to know a little bit about your workflow and your composer setup and sort of how you've set it up to kind of be optimized for how you work. Yep. Um, okay. So first of all. I'm on PC. I'm not on Mac. That's it's already controversial, apparently. Uh, <laughs> the forums are going crazy. Right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I'm uh, yeah, I'm on PC. I've been on PC forever, and I've actually got nothing against Mac. Uh, like it's PC is just what I know. Um, mm -hmm. So, and really, the only thing I'm missing out on is Logic because everything else is available for PC. So yeah, um, it's probably a handful of plugins that are coded for Mac only, but I'm really not bothered because there's a million plugins for PC. Oh, yeah. um, second of all, uh, I am not a fan of the Slave Vienna Ensemble Pro setup. I run everything in one computer. Oh, okay. Um, I'm just not a fan of the multi-computer setup. I will qualify this by saying I have a pretty souped up 
computer. Um, it's everyone told me don't buy the 18 core uh, Intel latest i9 processor. I've not had a problem with it, so I don't know what people are on about with that. They probably just set it up wrong. Um, mm. Uh, 128 gigs of RAM. Uh, all of my samples are on eight SSDs. Oh, dang. Um, and I have two M2 drives. Uh, my favorite sample libraries and Omnisphere are on the uh, one of the M2 drives, and then my system drive is on the other M2 drive. Uh, the M2 drives are amazing because their read speeds are... Th- up to 3.5 gigabytes a second which is wow insane uh yeah. and, my, and my solid state drives are all samsung 860s um and their read speeds are i can't remember what they are but they're adequate <laughs> so nice. uh yeah so running all of solid state drives um that was easily the biggest switch i uh, switch i made and I, i've been running off solid state drives for four years now um it's expensive, uh, especially when solid state drives are all four terabytes. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, eight times four terabytes that you, you know, everyone can look up what the price of that is on Amazon and be horrified. Um, yeah, that'll but, make your wallet scream a little bit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I've invested, you know, I didn't buy all eight at once. Um, you know, I, I gener- you know, you can, you can spread these things out to make things a little bit easier. Um, yeah. Uh, so that helps with the one computer setup. Now, here's the other thing. There's also probably, it's not controversial, it's just my approach. I don't use a template, um, which you probably were expecting that given that I don't run the Vienna Ensemble Pro thing. Not necessarily. I, I It seems like... There's it, a trend it, now, isn't there? Yeah, like, it's yeah. it's kind of... It, uh, sometimes you get the guys who have, you know, the the big templates and, you know, loaded with key switches or individual articulations. Yeah. And then you'll have some guys that are just like, nope, I just load up just a bare naked yeah. session and just kind of build from there, which which I do feel it has its advantages. So, so here's the thing. I think, like, when I'm starting a project, the blank slate is always good. But what happens is... You, you, a template builds while you're working on something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's not like you're starting from scratch every single time. You, once you've found the right string sounds for a project, you're going to use the same ones again. Mm-hmm. I just did uh, Minecraft Egyptian mythology, um, and I was just like, okay, I, I need to spend some time. And we, we, only, we only had a month to do it, so I'm like... Okay, well, I don't have a template. I need to make one. Um, I know I'm going to need a really good like string legato um, with good portamento in it as well. Um, so you know, I set that up. Um, I know I'm going to need some meaty brass because they wanted like a kind of an old-fashioned epic Hollywood mm-hmm. Egyptian soundtrack, which was yeah. awesome. Uh, um, so I was like, okay, well, uh, I know what brass sounds I'm going to use for that. And I just, I just, I don't have a massive base template. But I do make templates for projects, especially because after the first, after you've written a track or two, you start to see common themes. Like I, I knew which plucked instruments I was going to use. Like okay, well that sounds pretty good in Egyptian. Let's use that for like another six tracks. So yeah, um, and then that speeds up the writing process because then you're not fighting sounds. But I think it's just it's just a fact that you're going to spend time at the beginning trying to find the right sound unless you mm. unless you really know that you're going to be just doing a classical orchestra thing uh but even then so many of the sample libraries are recorded differently yeah a flute on one piece might not be the right one on the next piece it's it's just one of those things i think with a template for me personally you it's a very easy trap to set and end up sounding the same yes mm-hmm. it can help you write quickly but I think you should be writing quickly after you've done one or two pieces anyway <laughs> for the project. Yeah. So that's that's my philosophy. I'm sure there are amazing counter arguments to be made for the template approach. Mm-hmm. Um but it's just the way I it's just the way I work. So um for, and, and frankly the way that any whatever way anyone works what, whatever's best for them is is good. But yeah. Exactly. I I personally find like the the template is limiting and looking at all those empty tracks is depressing. Um <laughs> I know, like most doors now, have a feature where you can just hide empty tracks, but like mm-hmm. uh, it's just with a, with a button press. But it's just it's just still like it's it just feels wasted. And even even with these massive templates, unless you're using Touch OSC to jump around the template, you've still got to find the stuff. And that's like yeah. two seconds here, three seconds there. That adds up. Whereas, hey, I just want to load up a flute. Like it it actually doesn't take very long. Um, I'm a big fan of Contact's Quick Load system. Yeah, uh, I have so much stuff loaded up in Quick Load; it's insane. Um, 
and I know where everything is because I designed the menus. Um, mm-hmm. And it takes it really takes me no time to like add a new track. And especially when you're using a solid state drive. No, oh yeah, just you know, instantly it's, it's, it's right just there. there. Even even like a massive like sample library, like a, a really well recorded piano with like you know a, a million round not round robins but velocity layers. Um, you know, it just doesn't take just doesn't take that long to load. So um, that's that's the trade off I made a while back. I was like. If I'm going to run it all in one box, I better make sure that this one box is like the most kick-ass thing ever. And yeah, in most tracks, you're rarely going over a hundred. I, I mm-hmm. like if you're going over a hundred tracks, like what are there really a hundred different elements in your piece of music? Probably not. Yeah. Um, so I find that most tracks I end up doing, uh, you know, end up being like sixty to seventy max, um, mm-hmm. and that's the, that's the track count so like i'm never i'm never pushing my computer that hard and the here's i guess one other thing i kind of cheat with sample libraries a little bit because i think some sample libraries do sound some sounds a little bit better than others mm-hmm. Th- this is going to drive orchestrators crazy but uh for a long time i've felt that French horns in sample libraries do a better job at sounding like a trombone than actual trombone samples <laughs> which 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 sounds crazy but like so often i'll just be like well i'm gonna use the french horns for the low brass here and i'll just label it low brass because interesting because i know i'm going to record it later because mm-hmm. i feel that it blends better for the mock-up and our job is to sell the mock-up it's not to make the yeah. most it's not to make the most realistic mock-up um who cares if the french horns you know are written down where the trombone what with the trombones if it still sounds like an orchestra Mm-hmm. Um, obviously this depends greatly on the style of music that you're writing but I, I, I do cheat a lot I like to use flautando patches sometimes for soft strings because I think they sound better than the muted string patches which usually have a little bit too much high end on them that's a personal preference but yeah. um, if I actually put flautando on you know when I was when I'm notating things up for the orchestra to play most of it wouldn't work because flautando is super 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 quiet mm-hmm. but often I'm orchestrating and also, if I if I'm having someone else orchestrate, then I'll just label the track accordingly. I'll just put string muted strings, and mm-hmm. then they'll be like, "Oh, consordino in the notation." Um, I'm not going to label track strings flautando because it it doesn't matter. I know that they're going to be muted strings at the end. Um, mm-hmm. So I I am doing what sounds best for the mock-up because yeah, the um, ultimately whether you're recording or not. No one cares about the realism of the mock-up. All they care is if the music makes them feel something. And if that means exactly. cheat- cheating on the samples, so be it. Yeah, that's that's a really cool approach. I've, I've never really heard anyone mention that before. Usually it's always, you know, I got my French horns doing the French horns thing. I've never heard anyone really say, well, sometimes I use a French horn. As got, a- your, got your flute <laughs> one, two, and three, and you put, notate all those in. And I, I'm sure my MIDI is a nightmare to work with for orchestrators, but like... <laughs> Uh, but 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 then again, maybe it isn't because I put a lot of things on the same tracks. Um, so you know, it's it, it's one of those things. I think in my music, you can hear what the music should be doing in the mock-up. The mock-up is always clearly intentioned. Um, so an orchestrator, I give the orchestrator MIDI and audio stems, and mm-hmm. they can usually figure it out. They're like, well, yeah. obviously Gareth didn't mean for the French horn to sound like that. Obviously, we need to split it out between the trombones and the tuba. Um, so. It's it's one of those things um, that again that's a personal preference and it's a personal workflow thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there, there's a there's a lot of ensemble patches in sample libraries. I think they're amazing. I, I often think it's they they can end up sounding better in the mockup than um, than doing mocking up everything individually. But again, this does depend on the type of music that you are writing. If you're writing mm-hmm. really intricate stuff like John Williams style, then yeah, you need to put in all the individual parts and 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 spend yeah. a lot of time getting things set up. But let's let's be brutally honest for a second. How many of us are being paid to write John Williams style music? Probably not that many. Uh, yeah. And frankly, I don't think people are coming to me to write uh, to write John Williams music. So mm-hmm. um, they they're coming to me to be me. Um, so yeah. I, I will continue on this uh, terrible path of cheating on sample using on how I use my samples. Um, except yeah. I, I don't regard it as cheating. So uh, <laughs> yeah, like you said, what well, works for you? Um, uh, what DAW do you use? 
So for a long time, uh, I'm actually in a transitional period at the moment. Oh, really? uh, for a long time, I had been using Cakewalks Sonar, um, and they went out of business. Um, they were kind of in flux like earlier this year. They've been picked up by another company, but basically development I think has stagnated on the project, and I'm oh. I'm just uncertain as to where it's gone next, uh, where it's going to go next. So uh, I am currently learning and enjoying reaper um oh wow so but i've also um i found a guy who had made an amazing amazing template for film and game scoring online um that um i looked at it and i was like okay this is good but i need some customizations to this um and uh he i gave him a list of my customizations and he's made them uh and i'm still getting learning my way around reaper um but this template um is it's not it's not a template as in like multiple instrument tracks it's really just a template that sets up routing and mm -hmm. makes things really easy because reaper is fundamentally different they don't have audio tracks midi tracks buses they just have tracks that which is yeah. like very overwhelming for like when you're first dealing with it mm -hmm. but this guy has basically set up all of the routing he's just made things really easy so you can do what i do and just like add your contact instrument and everything's in the right place and routed correctly and stemmed correctly oh nice. and, and at the end you can just press one button and it'll do a fast bounce of all the 30 pre-routed bounce uh, pre-routed bounces buses <laughs> um pre-routed buses um and it just does a fast bounce of all of them and then you're done all inside the box um, and because it's That's Reaper, crazy. because it's Reaper, it's insanely fast. Um, uh, way, way, way faster than Sonar. And Sonar is a fast door. That's why I loved it, because it's a very, very well-optimized sequ uh, sequencing program. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, this switch to Reaper, um, I first became aware of... I mean, I've known about Reaper, but it, f it caught my attention when Will Roger, the composer of the latest Call of Duty game... He used Reaper to score Call of Duty, and he did it all in one project file. Oh, wow. Like, three hours of music or something insane in one project yeah, file. And he, crazy. Said, and he said it never got bogged down, because Reaper's amazing, and it's so well-coded, because it's coded by one person, so there's no bloat. Mm -hmm. There's no bloat. Um, and I have found that when, when using it. So I'm still... I've still got some legacy stuff that I'm switching over um, that I need to... Um, and I need to like learn the program because I feel like I'm driving a car, but I don't really know how to drive the car. If that makes sense, like yeah. I don't know how it handles over curves, and I don't know how it handles going up hills and things like that. So I'm still, I'm still learning it. Um, but because of the way that you can customize Reaper to basically do anything that you want, I feel like with the help of this guy who understands how to code stuff for reaper and i don't have a clue i'm just basically whenever i want something i'm just like hey uh i'll you know i'll hire you to you know make this little customization for me and can you make it and he's usually like yep uh uh and and great off we go um we're, we'll we'll have that addition for you next week in like my own custom version of reaper um, yeah that's awesome so yeah i mean just like a little thing that i asked him to look into i was uh like because right now it prints all 30 stems whether they have information on them or not and i'm like well i don't really want to have to deal with 30 stems do you have a way of like telling reaper not to print stems that don't have information on them and he was like, yeah, I just need to figure that out. And I'll probably have an update on it next week. It's just like little things like that that save me another two to three minutes of time. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I am I still have Sonar installed because I have so much legacy stuff that, you know, I need to be able to open stuff up if people, you know, want things changed or edited or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I am now moving over to Reaper. I did try Cubase. Uh, I found Cubase woefully inefficient. Um, uh. Uh, I think Cubase is designed specifically to work with Vienna Ensemble Pro because Vienna Ensemble... I think Cubase basically works amazingly if you load nothing in it. 
<laughs> um, like cause, uh, unless you like because because i just found that the performance was so like not what i'm used to with sonar um uh, you know i have a test midi file it just loads up a bunch of contact instruments and mm-hmm. like just play scales just so i can check out performance yeah. um and and cubase was so far behind sonar and and so far behind reaper in terms of performance and i because i'm working on one computer I need raw performance. Now, yeah. if you're running the slave system, well, who cares what the performance is like on the base computer? Obviously, it needs to be good, but mm-hmm. um, really, the, the work is being done by you know your sampler computers. But because I do everything inside the box, um, I need you know I need my, the box to be good and I need the the door to be extremely efficient. So um, I did try DP as well. Um, the the next most efficient one was uh, PreSonus Studio One. That was a close second because I really like its UI. Um, mm-hmm. But with Reaper, you can customize the UI, so who cares? <laughs> like, you're like, hey, can you uh, make Reaper look? I mean, like I mean, pr- pretty, pretty much. Like, I mean, you can ju- you can make it look however you want. So it's just like, well, if I can customize everything, I might as well just take the best of like all the all these different worlds and see if I can, over time, have a door that is tailored to me. Um, yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I will be on Reaper for the foreseeable future. Um, but you know, I know how to use all of the other ones. So it's, mm-hmm. it's uh, um, this like uh, I think fundamentally, as long as they help you make music and don't get in the way of making music, that's the most mm-hmm. important thing. Yeah, exactly. When it, uh, you said that you work a lot on the box, do you do a lot of your own mixing too, or like uh, do you use any like hardware or? Like when it comes to when it comes to the orchestral side of things, uh, I have someone else mix it because, frankly, looking at you know forty microphones f- could be fifty depending on how big the group is. It just mm-hmm. it's just scary. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, when it comes to the big orchestral sessions, uh, I bounce everything down to audio stems. I don't bounce down every track. I think that's ludicrous. I want my mix engineer to be able to mix rather than like just do track management um so i bounce down stems intelligently um and then yeah it's usually just about getting the pre-records to blend with the orchestra anything i'm doing inside the box yeah i mix myself but i still bounce everything down to audio um i when i'm mixing i want to not have access to the midi um so basically, I'm finished being committed to the compositional side of things, and then I'll create a new project and mix just with the audio files because that keeps me away from the MIDI, basically. Um, mm. And it gets it just gets me thinking differently. Um, yeah. I think it just gets me in a different creative space. Um, you don't want to go back and like tweak little MIDI notes, like, oh, what if I just increase this velocity a little bit here? Like, only just- <laughs> only if it's a mistake. But like generally, once I'm committed, unless the mistake is really egregious and pokes out. Um, I can probably fix it in audio. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, then I use a different environment as well. I used to mix inside Sonar just because I knew everything was, but you know, with, with literally everyone using Pro Tools and Pro Tools yeah. being a great audio environment, um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, mixing in Pro Tools. And, and mixing in Pro Tools is actually really easy and great fun. So um, yeah, so I don't, um, I don't mix everything, but yeah, anything that's like entirely electronic, um, like whether it's a synth-based score or if it's just doing uh, mocked up with samples, then uh, mm-hmm. then I'll mix myself. Uh, speaking about, I guess, from the orchestral stuff, we kind of covered a lot of that. Um, one of the things I thought was really cool about the score for The Unspoken was a lot of the really heavy, gritty sort of electronic elements to it. And uh, like some stuff that even sounds like some heavy alternative rock and... Um, and I thought that was really cool because it was like such a, you know, a contrast to some of the other stuff that I've heard. It seems like like you're very versatile and you can kind of play around in different genres when you want. Yep. And I, and I was wondering, um, how is it writing that score compared to more traditional orchestral? Like, do you enjoy it a little bit more? Or is it just kind of fun to step away and one of get those with, it? with with that project? It was. It was really cool to 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 start off with, especially. I'm like, wow, I have like a completely open progr- uh, playground, and it's it's like orchestra is banned. Um, so uh, <laughs> no strings. No, yeah, no strings. I mean, so honestly, it kind of took me back to when I was being when I was 16, 17, and 18, and just fooling around with the uh, really basic sound sets on like on software synths back in the day, and trying to get the absolute best out of them. Obviously, mm-hmm. we're spoiled for choice now. There's so many synths and cool tools that allow us to come up with amazing sounds um 
But with that project, so much of it, so much time was spent on palette design. And that project, how do you create a template for a project like that? Yeah. yeah so so totally. this is the thing, like, because uh, I've, I've just railed on templates. Like, that is the perfect <laughs> example. that You can't make a template for a game, like, about wizards in 21st century 21st century chicago um <laughs> like and they made it very clear they didn't want anything remotely that sounded like harry potter so um they want it to be modern urban and gritty and i'm like great this is like not what i've done before nice. um and yeah i mean i just spent a lot of time you know finding you know finding sounds in omnisphere whatever synth you know whatever synth i was interested in using in mm-hmm. um and then I, I like finding bass sounds and then messing them up. Um, so um, one of my favorite sets of plugins to use is, uh, is by Audio Damage, um, an appropriately named company, uh, <laughs> because they have some wild plugins that just can do crazy stuff to audio, and they're all really cheap, and they're really fun to use. They got sim- they haven't got annoying, obnoxious interfaces with like tons of buttons. Often mm-hmm. they're like... They're just very clear and simple to use, and they're very, very light on the CPU. Um, like their delay plugins, for example, are like they got one amazing one called Dubstation, which does this cool reverse delay and it loops the delay because it's based on dub music. Mm-hmm. Compare that, and I'm sorry, Fab Filter. I love Fab Filter, but I can't use Timeless because it is the most horrible interface ever. Um, oh. Like it just <laughs> like when you just want like I just want an eighth dotted eighth note delay. Like where is that? It's just it's just like it's just not intuitive to use compared with sound toys echo boy or or dub station um mm-hmm. so but again that's my choice i know people have probably come up with some crazy stuff in timeless um just you have to find it yeah you just have to find it um but yeah with that project i spent so much time investing in in the the palettes for each for each character uh, and and any of the environmental settings that 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 were being played in um the one thing that helped glue everything together um uh, was having a featured solo instrument for the for each character so mm-hmm. for the anarchist we had solo cello but it was mostly electric cello because anarchist <laughs> yeah uh then we had solo voice for one of the other characters and solo electric violin for one of the other characters so uh, you know even the lead instruments were a little bit more punk rock basically rather than you know let's have a flute or you know because it just wouldn't yeah. work Take um, a, flute, a flute and run it through some distortion well that that <laughs> could have worked so um uh but then the other thing that we did was uh we recorded we recorded live drums on everything um That's so cool. uh which because so much of that music is groove based um mm-hmm. i was like i don't want to stay in the electronic realm uh we need the feel of a real drummer um, we need someone who can do ghost notes properly because ghost mm-hmm. note programming is really difficult on MIDI drums. Yeah. Um, and you know, also I just wanted someone to mash some drums for a day, basically, because I've never done that before. So I was oh, like, that's cool. um, so we did that in East West Studio Two, which is one of the great rock rooms in Los Angeles. Um, really, really high ceiling, but not a massive room. Uh, so. Mm-hmm. The drums just sounded. You definitely need earplugs going into that room uh, with uh, with a drummer. Um, and mm-hmm. even even with earplugs, it's kind of like, wow, this guy is really mullering these drums to like. <laughs> uh, but it was, we just were able to capture a really great sound, and that just added so more life and vibe to the to the tracks. Um, but yeah, the actual compositional side of it wasn't too difficult because because it was groove based, um, like. There, it's more just like once you found the instruments to blend with each other in an interesting way, um, then it's all just about creating a track which ebbs and flows. But I wasn't really depending, looking for a melody with that one. That one was all about like finding a texture to evoke a certain feeling and mood. Mm-hmm. Did you start with a lot of drums as far as like were, were you like really trying to get the rhythms first before sort of adding any kind of uh, instruments that had sort of a melodic feel to it or on the more... on the contrary actually the sounds i started with were the sustained sounds um mm. sustained sounds followed by the pulsing sounds um no actually the rhythms came kind of came at the end uh because because the sustained and pulsing sounds took up quite a lot of space in the mix i wanted to make sure that they all blended first because the drums were going to cut through no matter what so mm. Um, yeah, it was all about the stuff like happening in the low mids and the mids and the high range, whereas the low end uh, and the, and like the the ticky stuff like that came right at the end. 
I'm wondering, because I know with composers, you know, spending so much time in your studio working on music and writing music all day, uh, what do you what do you do when, you know, when you're away from the computer? Like, what are some things that people can find Gareth doing, you know, when you're not slaving away at uh, programming? Uh, so... I, I mean, I do like to play video games a lot. That is a very easy way for me to escape. Um, and there's, because, you know, we I have less time nowadays, there's literally always something I can be playing that's just come mm-hmm. out. Um, so that's good. Uh, I do watch a lot of films and TV as well. I think it's imp- it's important to, like, stay up to date with, like, current trends and, like, what's what's popular um and what what kind of what kind of stories are people enjoying at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um outside of the house uh i've since turning 30 um i've invested a lot more in personal health um because you can't get away with the stuff that you get away with in your 20s oh yeah yeah tell me about it <laughs> um so yeah i uh, i'm exercising three to four times a week uh, oh that's great and i'm dieting much better than i used to and i found i found well here's the thing i found that since exercising i can actually work for longer um because if you're exercising it is physical exercise but there's also a mental part like you have to work mm-hmm. you have to you actually have to work really hard to like do exercise properly there's mm-hmm. a mental aspect to that too so um i found that exercising has made me work faster and more efficiently um as well that's awesome um, just because i think it a- activates a completely different part of the brain um and when that part of the brain is satisfied then it kind of balances itself out i'm sure there is some deep scientific study on the correlation between physical exercise and uh productivity um but uh i don't have access to it right now but i'm pretty sure there is a <laughs> i'm pretty sure there is a positive correlation um other than that my my main thing to do I spend far too much of my disposable income on eating out. Um, I love eating at fancy restaurants. I love, uh, but I also love eating at holes in the wall too. I love discovering new food. um, Mm. And uh, I love, I think if I wasn't a composer, I would probably be a cook at this point. Um, (laughs) Because I do think there is some crossover between the two disciplines, especially at the high level, because there it becomes a more artistic endeavor rather than just I am cooking to feed other people. Um, So I am deeply fascinated by the creative process that goes into creating some of the the high end stuff. And it doesn't always work. Um, You can, but, but even when it doesn't work, you can always appreciate the artistry like Penderecci's music, uh, like, I can appreciate the artistry that goes into making that music, but would you want to listen to it for three hours? Probably not. Um, <laughs> uh, it's the same. It's the same with some types of cuisine or some types. Some types of cooking. Like I'm like, man, this looks amazing on the plate, but I'm not. I'm still not enjoying it that much. It's not like taking my breath away. Um, mm-hmm. So th- that whole part of it is is very fascinating uh, t- to me. Um, so and, and with with it being a you know everyone needs to eat. Let, that's that will never end for me like uh you know anytime i go to europe because i'm from europe uh Mm -hmm. you know that's another opportunity to try out some new stuff i lived in japan for three years so i've had some of the world's best sushi um so yeah uh, that's crazy and and america america doesn't even come close um uh, yeah yeah, i believe it (laughs) it's uh um, so yeah whenever i travel or go to sessions it's like okay well let's look at the good local restaurants and see what we can find um and uh, I, I finally got reservations to the French Laundry, which I'm going to next month, which is generally considered to be the best restaurant in America. So we'll see. We'll see if it lives up to the hype. Um, yeah, hopefully. Hopefully it does. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, oh, I guess the other thing is I'm very, I'm probably, I, d- definitely in my social circle, I'm like the only person I know that's really into sports. And I'm really into American sports, which usually throws most Americans. They're like, you like American football? And I'm like, yeah, I probably know more about American football than you do. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I follow American football, American football, baseball, college football, and then basketball is a distant fourth after those three. Uh, mm-hmm. But I also follow uh, follow English football, which you guys call soccer. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I and uh, I'm a big fan of rugby too. Um, yeah, rugby's intense. Next year, I will probably go to Japan to watch some of the Rugby World Cup. Um, oh, nice! So, uh, that'll be that'll be uh, that. That's a plan I I have I have. Um, so yeah, but sports is a big thing for me because I like the drama that's in sports because uh, it's it yeah. is it is unscripted and it's like once once if you follow it you get to know you get to know the players and you kind of get to know their backstories and you and you get to see people 
at the highest level you get to see success and failure and that the emotion that goes on with that is also deeply fascinating to me it's it's the sports themselves it's one thing but it's actually the human side of sports that deeply fascinates me yeah the story element of it yep what about music like uh, as far as music is there anything that you like to listen to that that people would be surprised that you listen to um i mean i think i think the fact that i listen to so much electronic music would probably surprise a lot of people given that it's so far from like what i'm known for with especially Mm -hmm. with ori um like a band that i love just came out with a new album recently um the band's called hybrid um it's really just a guy and a woman now um Mm -hmm. and uh, they just bought, bought an album called light of the fearless but if you want to learn about production just listen to any piece of music that hybrid has written in their like 20 year career uh and then prepare to get depressed because whatever you listen to it'll be better than whatever production you are doing right now because their production is off the charts um it is i learn something every time i listen to their stuff even though i'm deeply familiar with all their work um Mm -hmm. and I probably learned about how to layer sounds more through listening to electronic music than any orchestral stuff because the really good electronic music, I'm not talking about EDM, the stuff that you hear at nightclubs. I'm talking about bands like Hybrid or Crystal Method or M83. Um, That stuff is even more richly layered than a lot of orchestral music. There's a lot going on in the music and it's Mm -hmm. it's all got definition. You can really hear everything. Um, and I have tried to learn as much from that as I can and then apply it in the orchestral setting. Mm-hmm. Um, like if you listen to Ori, there are a lot of layers going on in the music, but everything kind of has its own place. Um, so yeah, electronic music, especially heavy electronic music, because there's so much stuff going on in the mix. It's like, how did they make everything cut through so well? Um, I used to listen to The Prodigy, which is a pretty hardcore mm-hmm. British electronic group um, yeah. but their, their mixes are always so so interesting to listen to um, I'm going to try and think of more weird and esoteric stuff well, it's not weird but um, one of the composers who I think is a genius and she's incredibly underrated and underappreciated is Yoko Kano um, mm. I think she is probably the most versatile media composer in the world oh wow um I know it's quite a claim to make, but anyone who is familiar with her body of work uh, will will probably agree with me on that. Uh, yeah, there are lots of composers who are very good at doing one or two things, and that's totally cool because they're usually the best at doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she, she just sounds like she's the best. Like when, whenever she does something, I'm just like, well, that's great. You've just nailed that style, even though you've probably only been doing <laughs> it for like ten minutes, but. Um, yeah, if you just type in Yoko Kano into iTunes or Spotify and then just hit play, um, prepare to be amazed. Yeah, uh, I got to check that out. Um, yeah, it's Yoko, Y-O-K-O, Kano, it's K-A with two N's and then an O. Um, and uh, yeah, all of her work is very interesting to listen to. And it's, it's, it's impeccably produced and very intelligently composed. That's awesome. Yeah, it's always kind of disheartening when you see these artists where everything they do is just kind of like it's just like like oh you're good at that too like uh i don't know if if you're familiar with uh jordan rudis he's the keyboard player for dream theater yep he's been posting these instagram videos of him playing guitar now an eight string guitar and he's like doing these like little shredding licks and stuff and i'm just like oh (laughs) thanks a lot like i I don't even want (laughs) to you know eventually make me not even want to play guitar now he's already yep made me think i'll never be a good keyboard player and then he goes and He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll start playing guitar and he's all sh- doing some little shredding stuff. I'm just like, yeah, he'll probably be a master in like six months. It's crazy. Yeah, just it's uh, that's a lifetime of study right there. But some people just seem to seem to operate on a different level. Um, yeah. So um, I'm like, well, I'm never going to operate on that level, but maybe I can hire that person. Uh, huh. So <laughs> that that's that's like that's like a that's that, that would be the tactic. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can't beat them, join them. Well, th- yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, and there's so many other composers like who, whose work is deeply, deeply fascinating to listen to. And I'm just like, well, I could never do that. And and actually, I wouldn't want to even try. So, like, Gordy Harb is doing the music for Star Wars right now in the video game side of things. Mm-hmm. And uh, I listen to that stuff, and I'm like, yeah, I'll never get hired to do that, and that's okay. Uh, <laughs> like, and, and that's fine. Like, and. 
um you know mick mick gordon does the really heavy stuff for, for doom mm-hmm. and i'm like well i mean it's look i could learn how to do all of this stuff but i'm still gonna not have the experience of making all the stuff that these guys have you know they've been doing the you know they've been doing they've been focusing on that area for a while and they've really like, yeah. learned how to make that sound really good but you know i i i think ori is a certain sound that is not easy to emulate oh no yeah definitely not and it took a lot that took time for me to cultivate so um you know it's uh, i'll i'll commit to my own sound and, and see how far it takes me i guess um uh, i think one of the cool things especially in games at the moment is that there's a lot of different sounds um like just a lot of different palettes and different compositional styles and they're all coexisting um mm-hmm. like there's room there is a lot of room at a very big table for games whereas I feel like the the range of palette and emotion in film is maybe a little bit smaller because the playground is a little bit smaller. But games, the playground is kind of limitless um, because yeah. the types of games are being made are like the just the variety is absolutely enormous. Yeah, it's like it's never been bigger. It seems right. Yep, uh, and it's still growing. So, <laughs> lastly, I want to know since we were kind of talking about that, um, do you have any sort of dream projects or something that you would love to sort of put your name on or or projects or or anything that you would love to do that you haven't there are some i think i think with some games that like they are inextricably linked to their composers so i wouldn't want to touch them like you know i like with 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 star wars for example you know it's i i who wouldn't want to work on star wars no one would ever turn star wars down but like uh you know gordy has got that completely sewn up and he's absolutely nailing the feel um Mm. but so so the projects i'd be looking at are the ones which are kind of serialized at this point um and have and are using different composers um so i i'd love to work on an assassin's creed game uh, mm-hmm. because they are generally changing composers now quite frequently yeah it seems like it, it kind of varies a lot i, I mean jesper kid set the original tone for the assassin's creed and and it's amazing and like uh, the score for the most recent game assassin's creed origins which was done by sarah shackner she mm-hmm. captured the sp- spirit of jesper kid but also made it her own uh um, yeah. with her unique style and i thought that was really cool so i I'd, I'd love to have a chance to do that because i i also don't feel i'd be treading on anyone's toes does that make does that make sense yeah totally. um, like um another series that seems to be moving in that direction i mean they've always had multiple composers is uh, is mass effect um there's a lot of rumors that that game series is dead but i don't believe that's true i believe that there will be another mass effect game at some point i would love to work on that series um Mm. and i think yeah other than that as long as the game has a good story i'm i'm like super interested in working on it because i feel like my strengths are um matching the narrative and the flow and the and the and the story of the game um oh i i just want to mention it because i'm a big fan of the series like this is a game if I'd done the first one, I would have loved to have worked on it. But like now, because this composer is so linked to this uh, game series, uh, I'd never want to touch it. Um, it's the Bioshock series, so Bioshock One, Two, and Bioshock Infinite. Gary mm. Sh- Gary Scheiman's score for that is just it's just unbelievable. Um, mm. It's there is nothing in gaming or film that sounds like it, um, and he has branded that project forever. I I can't imagine a Bioshock game. You've really done your the best you possibly can for a game when you can't imagine any other music in its place and that can be you know that can be achieved through texture or it can be achieved through melody or it can be achieved through both um, yeah and you know the common theme with these with these projects is they all you know with, with especially with um uh with with the, the bioshock series is that like you know that has a very distinctive sound and you can't imagine anything else replacing it well, on that note, uh, I guess we're going to wrap it up here. But, man, I really appreciate you taking the time and getting to talk with you. Loads of insight. You're really cool. Really oh, cool yeah. Th- thanks. Uh, glad. Uh, yeah, we, we killed a lot of time with this one. I, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's been really great talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again. And good luck on all your future projects. And uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you in the future. Yep. Cheers, Craig. Thank you. As always, we want to thank you guys for tuning into the podcast. And if you enjoy these podcasts, please make sure to subscribe so you can catch all the episodes as we post them, as we're always trying to bring you guys awesome content and really great interviews with really awesome composers and musicians. 
And also, if you do enjoy these podcasts, please make sure to spread the word. Tell your friends. If you find us on iTunes and Apple Podcasts, make sure to like us, rate us, give us a review, and let us know what you guys think. So until next time, I want to say thanks again for listening, and we will see you soon.